I'll be talking to you about international relations implications of this technology. Now imagine how much the world, society, economies, militaries have changed since, say, 1780 up to the present. And imagine that same amount of change compressed down to a few years. In fact, we assert that the impact of uh, molecular manufacturing could be as great as the industrial revolutions of the last 200 years, from steam power to electricity to assembly lines to computers. But basically, when you're down in the range of 1 to 10 nanometers, you're down to the size of individual atoms and molecules. And as you know, as you learned in science class in high school, everything in the world is made of atoms, right? This table is made of atoms, the seat you're sitting on is made of atoms, the seat that's sitting in the seat is made of atoms, everything is atoms, right? The idea is if we can develop our technology to the point where we can actually build things with those atoms, using them as individual building blocks, then we would have the ability to really create powerful new kinds of products. We refer to nanotechnology that will not just make new products or contribute to better products, but really that will provide a whole new means of production. It's not just making better products. It's making a better way to make product. If we could actually get down to that scale, get our machines and our tools small enough to be able to build atom by atom, what sort of a, um, a manufacturing potential might we have? It's going to be what's called a general purpose technology. It will, it will infiltrate all industries, all segments of society. And because it has the potential to make products and use raw materials that are very inexpensive, it could really upset sort of the current order of things. We're at that stage now where we can really start to imagine uh, what's going to be possible and, and hopefully try to foresee how they might, how these things might affect society. If you hear people talk about nanotechnology, you'll often hear uh, glorious promises about all the wonderful things that it, it can do for us, defeating poverty, ending starvation, disease, opening up outer space, etc. that it's the next industrial revolution, it's really going to, um, to be a wonderful technology and we should put, as the US government is, a billion dollars a year into funding it. On the other hand, you'll hear other people say, well, but there are dangers that we have to be concerned about. Uh, environmental risks, possibility of disrupting our economic system. If you can make products in different ways instead of in factories, if you can make them on desktops, as we'll talk about, what does that do to all of our, basically our consumer product industry? So all sorts of possible disruptions, um, ubiquitous surveillance that a, a technology like this might make possible as well as one of our concerns, which is the, uh, a new arms race. Countries racing to build better weapons faster, getting into a spiral that could lead to a terrible war. The, the danger of these nano weapons may not be just the, the, the destructive power of each weapon, but the potential to make massive numbers, huge numbers of them, very cheaply and you know, essentially overnight. Um, we have something online where we say, imagine uh, the smallest possible weapon. Uh, you can imagine something about the size of a mosquito that could carry a toxin, a, 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 you know, a tiny flying weapon the size of a mosquito could carry enough toxin to kill a human being. Well, you could manufacture um, a suitcase full of those, a billion of them, in a few hours, theoretically, again, if you had the design and everything carry them in a suitcase, you know, and, and uh, release it inside Grand Central Station. You know, it's still, it's still going to be an incredible divide among the powerful and the powerless. And so as this continues, this, this amazing technology that develops, what's going to happen to our society? You know, how is this going to affect us? And I think you are going to see you know, an incredible, incredible amount of things that are good come of this, but I think there are going to be an equal array of things that are incredibly frightening. Uh, you know, we live in a time where we have made it a, a, a very, a, a very goal, a, a very specific goal of our government to keep the prolifer of, uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons to a very, very sustained and controlled few who are our friends. 
You know, the, 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 and it was only until recently when India and Pakistan, you know, each have bombs that, you know, everybody started to freak out. Where these two people really hate each other, what's going to happen? Because, you know, the Cold War ended, Russia went away, yippee, you know. You know, nobody wants to bomb America anymore. Um, so suddenly when this technology starts to go out and all of the people who aren't our friends start having access to this technology, which, you know, all it takes is one person who makes one machine who can make, you know, a hundred of these to sell them to somebody else and say, I've got a hundred of them, what do you want? Um, to start to unlock Pandora's box. You have a vastly widespread knowledge of, uh, and access to educational materials and so on. However, the same technology could also be used to make network cameras so that governments could watch our every move. The same technology that could provide trillions of dollars of abundance also might trigger a vicious scramble to control that abundance, to control the access to that abundance. Who will own this technology? Who will, how will, how far will people go to get control over that much potential value? Companies that sell products may not like the idea that you'll be able to make your own laptop uh, at home. Um, so it's, it, it could open up a lot of, you know, arguments, uh, <laughs> Uh, pretty fierce debates about who's going to control this technology, who's going to have the ability to license the products, the designs for the products, I should say. Because obviously you can't make a product unless you have a design for it. So it's going to take uh, people coming up with those designs, making them available on the internet and so on. And then um, the question will be who's going to authorize those designs? Are there, is there going to be any, you know, government agency or international agency that's going to decide what should and should not be made in those nanofactories or sh who should have access to those nanofactories. And then the question is, will everybody just go along with whatever that government agency says or will they try to find ways around it? A lot of big questions that need to be asked. Our whole focus is on raising awareness and getting people talking about this, people just like you, you know, so that uh, we can't answer, find all the answers ourselves. It's going to take a lot of people all over the world, and it's about time that we got that conversation started.